competition authority should be agnostic about the company's business model. Was that the point was not to go inside the firm and how it organised itself and arranged its products, but to think about how firms operated in their markets, obviously. And uh, this is something I used to believe myself. I was on the Competition Commission from 2001 to 2009. Um, one of the cases that I was involved in was looking at extended warranties. We had a split decision, and the, um, we found that there was a, a problem in the market and recommended a remedy of price transparency so that when you went shopping for your consumer goods, you would um, be able to see the price of the extended warranty linked to it at, on the shelf, when you bought the good for £200, you knew that the extended warranty that you'd be offered at the till would be on sale for £25. And one of our members um, was very um, opposed to this. He thought it would not remedy the problems we had found in the market, where actually it's only a very small proportion of consumers that benefit from these warranties. Most people can self-insure. It's much cheaper to save and replace your washing machine if it breaks down. And he recommended banning selling these warranties at the uh, point of sale. Give people a card or a form they can fill in, they can think about it at home and send it in later. And the majority of us said, we won't do that because um, uh, this will actually kill the market. And he said, that's my point, this is a market that should be killed. And this is um, uh, an abusive business model, if you like. It's something that's serving the interests of the company and the consultancy, the consulting firm that created it and it's highly profitable and there's very little consumer merit and lots of demerit in this market. And um, so that's what I want to talk about now and the business model in particular of a lot of digital platforms, the advertising based business model. And I think the idea that we should be agnostic about that business model is starting to fade, um, particularly in the European legislation that people have talked about today. And I um, agree with that. I want to talk about why I think that business model is a problem. Now, just a quick... Uh, move it for me. Sorry. There we go. Um, quick uh, review of uh, digital market economics, which I'm sure everybody's very familiar with. They have these characteristic winner-take-all dynamics. Um, so for some time, a new digital platform or model will grow extremely slowly build customers on one or both sides very slowly indeed. Most of them fail, but the ones that succeed get to a, a, a tipping point where they then start to grow very quickly and quickly gain dominance in that market. Uh, one of the main reasons for that, apart from um, old-fashioned economies of scale, which are extremely large in digital markets, or at least the marginal cost is very low compared to the fixed cost, um, there are network effects, and that's what drives it. And these can be direct, as in a telephone network, or they can be indirect, where it's on the opposite side of the market. But basically, the more people join, the more everybody, including existing uh, members, will gain. For the big tech companies, that's cemented by the data loop. They acquire a lot of data about their customers. This both enables them to tailor the service better and deliver a better product, um, and at the same time, uh, sell more advertising revenue because they can target advertising better and that gives them revenues that again enable them to serve consumers better. It's all fantastic for consumers. They are great companies with great products. So there's a, a lot of good things to like about them. Um, but in addition, and this I think causes quite a lot of the concerns about the big digital platforms, um, they um, use consumers' uh, behavioural patterns, uh, uh, they use what's called dark patterns in the business to create these addictive behaviours and compulsive clicking on links. And the reason for that is it's because the clicking on links absolutely drives the advertising revenues. So the more viral, the more clicks you get, the better it is. Now another bit of background that I'm sure we're all familiar with from personal life is how much time we're actually spending online now. Latest Ofcom figures for the UK, 28 hours out of every week. That's more than a day a week online, which is just really quite extraordinary. And um, a real acceleration around 2007, which was that moment when we saw the launch of smartphones, the availability of uh, 3G and then 4G and 5G and Wi-Fi, and the um, uh, software and market design principles that created apps. And since then, there has been this extraordinary expansion of uh, the time that we spend online. 
And to me, this means that we should be focusing much more in welfare analysis on time spent, the time cost for people of what they're doing online. And very often we, you know, we acknowledge the great work of Gary Becker in thinking about this and then park it. And it's time to uh, reintroduce these time issues into thinking about markets. So I want to focus in on just a few points about the model. And the first is how is this uh, behavioral aspect and the compelling power of free things. So this is a slide I use in my course. Ask people to stand for 90 minutes for $8 and they'll tell you to go away. This is in New York City. Uh, if you offer them a free lunch, they'll stand in line for 90 minutes, even if the lunch is only worth uh, $8 or they would only have spent $8 on their lunch. And um, just we know from everyday experience and many many studies that free is just an incredibly compelling consumer proposition the fca looked at the um the the reason people choose credit cards or switch credit cards is because they get some little present associated with them and they don't think about the underlying cost or you pick a magazine out in the in the shop when you want to read something on the train because it's got a little gift attached to the front or it's free in credit bank accounts. It's not free, of course, really, but that zero ticket price is incredibly compelling. So people don't price their time well. It's something that's quite hard for many people to think about. And um, you see this in the debate about um, what's the value of free digital services that uh, the Googles and Facebooks and so on offer. And this is something that I've been doing a bit of work on for the Office of National Statistics because the question has um, emerged, it is, are the GDP figures, the national accounts figures, taking due account of the benefits that consumers are getting from free digital services? Some of it's counted, the electricity consumption for charging your phone, the data plan that you buy, the, the phone that you buy. But um, surely there's a lot of consumer value that is not being priced in any way, and should we be taking that into account in thinking about economic progress? And um, so we recently did some uh, surveys look at asking people to state the value that they would need, uh, the amount of money that they would need to have um, all of these different uh, free goods and some paid for goods taken away from them for a year or 15 months. We ran this three times, once in February 2020 when we had no idea what was going to happen, uh, once in May 2020 and once in February 2021. And there have been some uh, very intuitive changes and you can see that there's quite a wide range of different um, median stated values. So personal email, online search uh, feature very highly, for example, um, and things like Snapchat. Who, who remembers Snapchat anymore? That seems to have gone completely out of fashion. Um, but some of the other digital services, not so much. And uh, some interesting changes too over that period. Uh, free parks really increased in their stated value uh, really substantially over that period. Um, Amazon, Netflix, so all, all the intuitive things that you would expect. But when um, we talk about this work, a lot of economists will say, this just doesn't pass the smell test because these are implausibly high stated values. And in any stated value work, if you compare willingness to accept, it's much higher than willingness to pay. And any willingness to pay calculation, or in fact, what you would pay for a newspaper compared to an online newspaper, they're much lower. And I think the answer to that is that there isn't a budget constraint here. These are free. And we're asking people to put monetary values for comparability with other economic goods onto something for which the cost is time. And um, so this again focuses our attention on the attention, the time that people are um, giving to these services as part, a core part of the welfare analysis. So why is everything digital free? And this man is part of the answer. This is Stuart Brand. He's the person who coined the phrase, information just wants to be free. He set up the Whole Earth Catalog in San Francisco and was a um, key player in that uh, originally very hippie, everything is free, we hate capitalism approach to uh, the emerging internet. A little bit later, of course, um, it became much more um, commercialized uh, with all of the establishment protocols by indeed a, a voluntary regulatory body, not, not governments. And um, then Napster came along. And this, I think, was a key moment because 
uh, some people here are too young to remember Napster, I think, but this was a free online file sharing. If you had music files, you uploaded them to a server and th these could be shared for free with anybody else. And the music industry decided that the thing to do was lobby Congress and uh, the ju judicial authorities and make sure that music fans got sued for listening to music because what they did not want to do was unbundle CDs and lose the margins that they had got from bundling music together, whereas fans wanted to listen to their greatest hits, their favourite songs. And um, this, I think, was a, a key moment in um, establishing in the minds of other parts of um, the economy the idea that it was going to have to be free and reinforced by, for example, newspaper experiments. They wanted to get people reading online, so they had to make it free to start with. So very early in the emergence of the commercial internet, a lot of the things that people wanted to access were indeed free. That had to be funded, and so advertising business models emerged as the way that would happen. And even Spotify now, which is one of the more successful subscription uh, services, is um, only about a third subscription funded and two thirds advertising funded with variations between markets. And they have just hired hundreds of people to drive ad sales further because that's where their revenue growth is going to come from. So advertising is at the core of the commercial internet economy. And uh, most of the attention and indeed the revenues go to Google and Facebook. This is a, t a chart from the CMA study of the advertising market, uh, which is a very interesting read. And so the big blue box is the Google sites and the orange box is the Facebook sites. And there are a few others who get some ad revenue, so Netflix, Snapchat, although I'm sure that's shrunk since then, as I was saying. Um, and Twitter, so there are, there are a few others, but the, the, domin the dominant um, holders of attention and of advertising revenue are Google and Facebook. Apple is shaking this up a little bit now, so we'll see what happens there. Now, the advertising model, um, and this again comes from the same report, um, is a, an increasingly vertically integrated market. There has been a lot of consolidation in this market and among the ad brokers who um, organise this incredibly complex and non-transparent series of exchanges between publishers um, and advertisers on the one hand and um, the consumers on the other side of that platform. And what you see here is that Google has a large share of all of these stages of the advertising market chain. So SSP is supply side platform, DSP is demand side platform, and at each end of this chain, Google has, an, uh, has a dominant market share. I once, many years ago, saw Halvarian give a talk where he did talk about the um, uh, a model and the algorithm that enabled, enabled them to maximise the dollars per pixel on the screen when you load a Google screen. And um, if you compare um, uh, screenshots of Google homepages over time, you will see how much more of that real estate has been taken up with advertising of either own products or other products over time. So this market is complicated, it's not transparent, um, it's highly automated as well, so it's actually quite hard for human intervention to affect the way the market operates, and it has um, become more consolidated over time. Now, I love this paper from um, 1950 by Nikki Caldor. Um, economists pretend that advertising is about information, you know, it's giving us useful information about products that we can compare in a reasoned way and pick which we want. Whereas actually it's mainly about shaping preferences, as these guys um, discovered in the 1950s. And um, the whole model is actually behavioural, it's based on Skinner's um, uh, uh, behaviourism. And so the behavioural aspects of what people do and how they allocate their time is really important here. So um, obviously this is a bit of an overstatement and that was um, uh, Caldor's way, but clearly people who are advertising their products do want to create that um, at least monopolistic competition. They want to shape consumer preferences. They want to get as much of the market as they can and they are playing into a digital advertising market which is dominated by two of the big tech companies. So, got some nice musical background there. Um, 
So my question is, and now I can't move my slide, can you click it again for me? Sorry. It's very exciting back here in the tech setup. There we go. <coughs> Oops. Um, so my question is, why is this the only business model? And um, it, it, what are the harms associated with that? There are these incredibly um, negative side effects. Um, there is this hunt for clicks. A lot of the online harms that we have started to worry about that are being addressed through other forms of legislation, not competition policy, uh, and, um, and which are quite concerning in themselves, that's driven by needing to get clicks to get advertising revenues. The, the big um, players really want um, viral stories, and the accuracy of those viral stories is not really relevant. There's the question about the use of consumers' time and, uh, and also their data allowances, by the way, so it costs money. But in particular, taking the time budget constraints seriously and thinking about the implications of we spend a day a week online and two-thirds of that is on Google and Facebook properties. Um, and what's the, what are the welfare implications of that? The privacy issues that we heard a bit about earlier and um, clearly the uh, accumulation of lots of personal data is driven by the desire to sell targeted advertising. If there were um, a different business model, then good consumer service would require some data collection, but not necessarily th on the scale that we see it and um, without the added incentive to sell analytics products on the back of that data to other people. Um, then we get the data loop that I mentioned earlier and the way that that feeds into the dominance of the big tech companies and the concerns that we have about contestability of those markets as a result um, uh, with this very complicated and non-transparent um, uh, market in the middle for advertising and indeed for data which has become consolidated and vertically integrated. And then finally that it actually crowds out competing business models just as free in credit current accounts crowd out complete competing business models. The competition authorities have always stepped back from enforcing charges for current accounts because that's going to be really unpopular with consumers. Um, but on the other hand, it is something that has raised many concerns over the years because it makes it hard for banks with different kinds of business models to enter that market without offering the same approach. And if you don't have um, free, in current account, free um, in credit current accounts, you can't get into the market and uh, you have to compete on the same kind of business model. So the agnosticism that we always used to have as competition practitioners, uh, uh, regulators, was fine when there were competing business models. And in that situation, I'm very comfortable with being agnostic about the business model or the choice of pro um, product construction. But I've come to believe that that ad-funded business model is actually quite pernicious um, because it, it preys on um, aspects of consumer behaviour that people don't think about very much and um, it has helped create this digital dominance. Um. So the question is, should we do anything about it? And there are a number of propositions. Paul Romer has strongly advocated for an advertising tax. And the more that we go online and get um, ads everywhere and pop-up banners, you can see the consumer advantages of throwing some, some grit in there and taxing it. And that would be quite a nice source of revenue as well. Um, I think there are some issues about enforcing it, but let's think about that um, and, and make it work. There are, there are pro proposals about reforming the advertising market itself. And uh, I think the CMA report is a very good basis for thinking about this. That would include things like uh, what are the terms and conditions? Are they sufficiently clear? Um, what should we do about dark patterns when uh, the platforms shape uh, consumers' behaviour using all kinds of behavioural theories? Uh, what about transparency? Should there be posted prices in these markets? What kind of data access should be mandated so that they can become more contestable? So there's a whole bunch of things that you could do there. And then. Um, and a final one, and this is one that I've written about and have also got Paul Roma interested in, um, is the public option. And uh, this won't go down well here in the IEA, but my analogy is broadcast markets, where the existence of the BBC in the UK 
has been a different business model and it means that competition in that market has occurred on more than one dimension and has given us a very creative, fast growing, high exporting um, uh, broadcast, broadcast ecosystem. And so should we even think, if it comes to it, about creating a public model that would create a competing business model? because the point about the agnosticism about the business models is when there is competition among them. And having a lack of business model competition has become a big problem in digital markets. Um, so I've left time for comments and questions. Great, thank you very much. There's lots of, uh, lots of questions on that. Where to start? Thibaut, do you want to kick us off? Sure. Yes, thank you very much. I think <coughs> this is a very important subject <coughs> that is very often ignored in competition policy. My question is the following. It seems to me that there is a competing business model, but maybe you will actually, I'm curious to, to hear from you what you think this might be the same, where you see that users do have to pay to use the platform aggregator, such as Netflix or Airbnb or Uber. And so my question is, why would it be the same business model? And if it is not the same, would you say that it is better for a competition agency with uh, scarce resources to put more of their efforts on those business models where it is indeed free for consumers, rather than the platform and aggregators where it is not free because they have to pay a subscription or you know, pay every time they rent a apartment on Airbnb? So my short answer to that is yes. And in um, sectors like accommodation and, and taxis, the, the, entry, the entry there, the digital entry, has been in areas where there's a scope for regulatory arbitrage. And I think they have um, typically been pro-competitive. And um, as you say, there is a consumer payment about which it's easier for uh, consumers to think as they make their choices. There are still dark patterns in those markets, and I think that is a concern. Um, you know, just think about when you go on booking.com, plenty of accommodation platforms to choose between, but that or Airbnb will um, offer you um, uh, add-on extras with pop-ups saying only three other people are looking at this now, you better book quickly, so all of those things need fixing. But yes, I would agree with you that it's the big companies that are reliant on advertising that I think are the biggest concern and worthy of the most attention. Uh, Steve? Um, <coughs> following on from that, um, as, as you, men uh, you mentioned various alternative models, and of course, as you know, people like Jared Lanier and Tim Berners-Lee have also suggested different forms of funding. So to what extent is the problem that we face in this particular market effectively a collective action problem mm -hmm. in as much as you can't, one company which is in that market cannot switch to a different funding model unless everybody does it, which suggests that perhaps you do need some kind of external action. I think I'd agree with that. Um, using the analogy of the free bank accounts, you, you know, one bank could not be the first to mm. do that because the cost that they would pay in switching would be, would be too high or they would fear it would be too high. Yeah. Um, and I think it is exactly the same issue as you suggest, that you can't be the first. And um, Spotify has tried. So I think it's an interesting border mm. example between the kinds that Thibault was talking about where the subscription and the payments do seem to operate yeah. and these, um, you know, I don't, I don't even quite know how to categorise them, but, but these, um, these quotes, free and, free and credit yeah. models. So I, I think I agree with that. Mm. And, well, Philip will... Yeah, go ahead. Philip and I will have a debate now. <laughs> well, actually, not at all, because I, um, I suppose one response to that is, is for the competition authorities to allow a cartel, like I suggested in my talk, so that the, um, uh, the, 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 the banks all decide together to abolish free and credit banking. Um, uh, uh, but in the absence of that, I'm just wondering about your, your you know, proposed public um, provider, because if we all like our, f um, our free at the point of use type models, how is a public provider going to be um, you know, remotely competitive with a, a, a different uh, business model? And related to that, I mean, I can honestly say that I really can't think of an occasion where I've ever responded to a, uh, an ad on Google or f Facebook um, or anything else that I use. So, although this is clearly a rational model for the uh, uh, for the uh, um, online companies. 
uh, how, how rational actually is it as an advertising model in the long term uh, for the companies which use it for advertising? The only, the only situation where I've um, en encountered it really being uh, useful is when universities, at, uh, during clearing, uh, and there are 160 of them, I think, in the UK, uh, by, by Google Ads. So there's certainly no competition problem there. And you could understand why students would go on to, um, and, and why universities would advertise there. But I can't ever remember, I mean, that might be because I'm just such a, a boring Yorkshireman, I can't ever remember sort of responding to a Google uh, ad or uh, uh, anything like that. Is this really a rational way to advertise, do you think? Uh, I'm not sure how keen a shopper you are in general, Philip. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, for advertisers, the um, lack of clarity about how effective online advertising is is no worse than the lack of clarity about other forms of advertising, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and and it's much cheaper. Yeah. So I, I, you know, I think there is a rationality to it to it there. They've got to advertise somewhere, so they'll go to the lowest cost place. Yeah. You know, and I think your your question about the public option is is the hard one to answer. Um, and it would need to piggyback on something that people already found very compelling. The BBC would be one obvious vehicle for it. There may be others that other people could think about. And um, it wouldn't work in some countries. So it probably would never work in the United States, even if it does have a Nobel laureate uh, interested in, in the model. But it, it, it might work in um, some European or Asian countries where mm -hmm. there's a different culture and framework and other, other public organisations on which that could piggyback. It's, it's obviously not easy, and I think it would only be one among a suite of things that you would do. But um, I use it kind of for rhetorical purpose to say um, some kind of collective action, public action is needed to bring business model diversity into this segment of digital markets. Uh, Sam, can we get the mic to Sam? Um, thanks very much. I th found that very provocative, uh, which is which is what the IA is all about. Mission um, accomplished. <laughs> yeah. So my. So really, what you've outlined is a theory of consumer behavior, and um, that, that may be the accurate theory, that basically there's a sort of behavioral bias um, that leads consumers to act more or less against their own interests and go for free things over paid services that don't have ads. Um, but obviously, we have no way of testing that theory uh, in the abstract other than real life. And um, what I would like to... No, or what, I, what I'd be interested in hearing is, um, could you make some falsifiable predictions that would allow us to test whether your theory is right, or whether consumers actually don't regard advertising as being very costly to view, um, and so maybe just prefer ads because ads aren't that bad? And my kind of question to summarize, really, then, is being aware of all the biases and being aware of the costs of advertising as you are, do you pay for YouTube premium? Oh, um, I don't use YouTube at all, um, but I do pay for premium Spotify, if that answers that question. I don't think of it as a theory. I think of it as an empirical um, observation, actually, rather than a theory. And I don't think there is a good overarching behavioural theory that tells you why um, consumers fall prey to dark patterns or why they think more about um, money than time. Um, this is just observation from a number of market studies and I think you know perhaps more consumer surveys is the way to go on that and I was also careful to emphasize that people place they state a high value for these services so that it's <coughs> a trade that they think is, is well worthwhile um, whatever your belief is about the rationality or otherwise of their um, their underlying um, preferences and way of thinking about making choices can we squeeze one more in Claudia Hi, thank you so much for this um, presentation. That was very interesting. One comment and then two questions. So the comment on the effectiveness of the advertising is, I mean, they, the online advertisers will understand how effective is very often because you click through, say, from Instagram to a particular you know, seller, so they will understand very well. They can, you know, they have they have perfect transparency as to how many clicks they get, or and and then actually whether that click is is translates into a purchase. So it's actually that actually you know helps them understand probably better than in the in the non-online world how effective the advertising was. And then the questions I really liked um, your um, the point that you make about the fact that the almost more the more toxic the content, the more valuable the time spent. Uh, well, time spenders for, for, for advertisers because it attracts all the more 
uh, users, and in a way that's part of the uh, the testimony by the by the by the by Francis Haugen now as well. It's at the, at the heart of this. So, do you think, in terms of the questions, first of all, as part of the solution, what do you think about stricter content regulate mod content moderation and regulation? And then, secondly, what do you think about breaking up the tech monopolies? <laughs> Thank you. Um, just on your comment, as I understand it, um, the one thing that they can't actually um, understand is whether you go ahead and make a purchase because of privacy regulation, and that's why the same advert will follow you around even after you've bought whatever the product was. So uh, in terms of clicks, absolutely. Um, and maybe I've misunderstood it, so no, some, no, no, something no, for no, me no, to no, find no, out. No. <laughs> um, I'm not an advocate of breaking up the tech companies because um, uh, so much of the value that consumers get from them comes from network effects. Um, I would be an advocate for much stronger um, scrutiny of mergers because none of them have been scrutinized. And that's clearly we, you know, the error choice was not in the right place there. I'm sorry, I've forgotten the first question. The first question was just about, given that some of the harm is about the content and the toxicity oh. of the content, content moderation. what do you think about as part of the solution, the content regulation, content moderation? I think in an ideal world, I would deem them to be publishers. Mm -hmm. And back in the day, when online first started, Ofcom discussed whether they should be de uh, deemed to be publishers and be responsible for content and decided that it was already too big a task for them as a regulator to take on. But my goodness, um, I think that's had some that downsides, that decision. And I don't know if you can now go down that route. So we are probably in a world of thinking about different kinds of limits on content uh, administered by the companies themselves. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.